Step 7. Complex notation. In this final step of the lesson, we will go over some basics of complex numbers and how complex notation can help us in uh, describing waves. So first, we want to ask the question, why do we even need complex notation? After all, sines and cosines pop up everywhere when we talk about waves. The problem with sines and cosines is that uh, they're very general, they can describe many uh, complicated shapes just by superposing uh, many uh, sines and cosines together. However, by doing that, we are co complicating our lives. Trigonometric expressions can get very long very quickly and therefore the calculations that include trigonometric expressions can get very difficult and cumbersome to handle. That is why we are switching to complex notation. Complex numbers are a very elegant way of uh, talking about trigonometric functions and therefore they simplify a lot of the mathematics that's behind doing calculations including waves. And also uh, we have to think about the future and if you go into fields like quantum mechanics or quantum optics or engineering you will see complex numbers crop up everywhere. Therefore it's good to be fluent in their use. So, what are complex numbers? We're going to start with Cartesian coordinate representation of complex numbers, where a complex number z is represented as x plus i, y. x and y are real numbers, and this factor here, this complex phase i, is defined as the square root of negative 1. x is called the real part of the complex number, and y is called the imaginary part of the complex number. If we have two different complex numbers, z1 and z2, with their um, respective uh, real parts x1 and x2 and imaginary parts y1 and y2, we can perform basic operations on them in the following way. If we want to add two complex numbers together, that's very simple. We just add the real parts to get the new real part and we add the imaginary parts to get the new imaginary part. Subtraction is just as simple. All we have to do is we take the difference of the real parts to get the new real part and we take the difference of the imaginary parts to get the, real part, uh, the new imaginary part. However, if we try to multiply two complex numbers together, in Cartesian coordinates the rule to obtain the new real part and the new imaginary part becomes a little bit more complicated. Similarly, if we try to divide two complex numbers, then the real part is this following expression and the imaginary part is this following expression. So you can see that um, in Cartesian coordinates it becomes quite difficult to handle very basic operations of complex numbers. That is why we are going to change to polar coordinates. In polar coordinates we're thinking of a complex number z as a point in a, in a plane uh, called the argon diagram. And here the coordinates are given by the, uh, the horizontal uh, axis, which um, tells us the real part of the complex number, and the vertical axis, which tells us the imaginary uh, part of the complex number. The distance from the origin to our complex uh, number z is given by parameter r, coordinate r, and the um, angle here, theta, between the uh, real axis and uh, and the line connecting to our complex number z is given by theta. And in this uh, coordinate representation, we write the co uh, complex number as follows. It's r times e to the power of i theta. Why this is, we will see shortly. How do we go between Cartesian coordinates and polar coordinates? That's quite simple x in the Cartesian coordinates is equal to r times cos theta, which you can see from this diagram here, and similarly y is equal to r times sine theta. So if we have a, oh sorry, this uh, r is also referred to as magnitude and modulus, and this theta, this angle theta, is sometimes referred to as argument, but often we will just call it the phase. There's a very important uh, identity between cosines and uh, uh, complex exponentials, and that's the following formula. e to the i theta is equal to cos theta plus i sine theta. From this, you can also see why we wrote z uh, as follows here. 
if I just add r in front of e to the i theta, I have to multiply the right-hand side as well. So I have r cos theta plus i r sine theta. So you see that r cos theta is just x, and r sine theta is just y. So we recover our um, Cartesian coordinate representation or complex number z. Similarly, if instead of theta I have minus theta, then all uh, we pick up is this minus sign in front of the i. Using these two expressions, we can uh, go back and rewrite our trigonometric functions in terms of exponentials uh, of complex form, or like this. Cos theta is just a half uh, times e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta, while sine theta is just 1 over 2i, and then it's times the difference between e to the i theta and e to the minus i theta. And these are very important, and this is how we are going to talk about waves using complex notation. So now if we go back to our original two complex numbers, z1 and z2, uh, represented in terms of their individual moduli, r1, r2, and their individual faces, theta1 and theta2, we see that the multiplication is now very simple. All we have to do is we have to mu multiply r1 times r2, and the new phase of the complex number is given by the sum of the two individual phases, theta1 plus theta2. Division becomes equally simple. The new modulus of uh, um, the complex number z1 over z2 is just given by r1 over r2, and the new phase is given by the difference between theta1 and theta2. So you can see, compared to Cartesian co coordinates, these uh, operations now become very simple to handle. Also, we have to talk about the conjugation of a complex number, and that simply takes the complex number z and switches um, the uh, sign in front of every i that appears in the complex number. So x plus i y becomes x minus i y. And we denote this uh, um, conjugation operation by a star. So we say z star is the complex conjugate of the complex number z. And in polar coordinates, we do the exact same thing. So r e to the i theta changes into r e to the minus i theta. And using the conjugation, we can express the real part of z as the sum of z and z star divided by 2, while the difference z minus z star divided by 2i gives us the imaginary part of the complex number. And the modulus of the complex number r can be obtained simply by multiplying z with its own conjugate and taking the square root. So let's get back to waves and see how we can write them in complex notation. Before we had wave functions like psi1 is equal to amplitude a times cosine of kx minus omega t, or we had a um, similar function but sh by shifted, so y2 was a times sine kx minus omega t, and we can see that here psi1 is equal to cosine of some uh, angle theta, while here psi2 is equal to sine times some angle theta. And this immediately reminds us that uh, these can be written as the real and imaginary parts of some complex number, which we saw before. So the complex number now is given by this expression here. We've got the amplitude of the wave, which is acting like the modulus of the complex number, times e to the i and this theta, uh, this phase, which in our case for a wave is kx minus omega t. If we take the real part of that expression, we recover our cosine curve. If we take the imaginary part, we recover the sine curve. But often uh, we will not even care by, about taking the real part and the imaginary parts. Simply we are going to write down waves as follows in the complex notation. So we will write psi of x and t is equal to amplitude a times e to the i kx minus omega t. So let's check that this is a valid wave by substituting it into the wave equation. So here's our wave equation in one dimension. So all we have to do is we have to compute the left-hand side, which is the second order partial derivative with respect to space uh, here given by x. And what we get is the following, minus k squared times psi x of x and t. 
if we go on the right hand side and we compute the second order partial derivative with respect to time, we get minus omega squared times psi x of t. Putting them together, we get the following expression. And we know that the wave equation is satisfied because we know um, how to compute the phase velocity v of this wave. And that's simply given by omega over k. If you don't remember this uh, uh, expression right here, you can go back to our first module where we derived it. So substituting for v, we can see that both sides are equal and therefore uh, our wave function psi written in complex notation satisfies the wave equation. And this covers the very basics of complex notation.